and uh, the title uh, for the message this morning. We've been talking about sound, and we've been uh, uh, spending most of these weeks in uh, Genesis chapter 1 and verses 1 to 3. Today I'm going a little bit further from that, uh, from that uh, scripture, but we've seen that everything in creation started with sound. <coughs> This is one of the reasons why also music is so important in our worship, in, a, in the way God instituted worship. The symbols, the instruments of strings, all this because God started creation with sound. The Bible says, uh, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. We all, we've also seen how uh, recent scientific uh, theories uh, came to the conclusion that everything that exists in nature is a consequence of uh, vibrating sounds or a form of a vibration or sound. And today that theory, it's, uh, it's more than a theory, it became practical science, it's called the string theory that says that the, the, the most, uh, uh, the, the, the single particle when you get to the division of the atoms, the, the photons, the protons, everything, you get to some filaments that vibrate and produce kind of a sound waves. And it's through those vibrations, that energy, that all that we have in this material world exists. This pulpit, this platform, your house, your own body. We're, we're created uh, uh, wonderfully by, by our God. And uh, nothing happened in nature without this divine uh, architect, Amen. our God. Amen. He planned everything. He called everything to existence. Everything started with sound. And also in, a, in the way we relate to God, sound is very important because we listen to the Word of God we listen to worship and also we speak and we pray to God. And, and this is a very important part of our being. So studying last week about tempo and the need that we have to understand that God moves at, at a different pace and speed than we do. Today I thought uh, talking about rhythm and that's the title of my message for this morning. And everything in, uh, has a, a rhythm. Uh, you know that God has a rhythm? Do you know that? God has a rhythm, and uh, everything, in fact, has a rhythm. Uh, the universe has a rhythm. Uh, also, the planets in our solar system, they have a rhythm. They, they rotate at different uh, uh, speeds. The Earth has a rhythm. We call it uh, a year, we call it a day, but uh, the spinning uh, uh, revolving around itself, it's a day, and the rhythm around uh, the, the, the sun, also we call it a year, and that's the, the rhythm of, of the things that we have uh, he, um, in terms of planetary. Uh, the seas have a rhythm. We have the tide. And uh, every about six and a half, seven hours, um, I, I, I'm not, I don't know exactly, but we have, uh, we have different tides. We have four seasons. Our bodies also uh, have a, a, a rhythm. So we, we all uh, have seasons in our bodies, and in this rhythm of our body, uh, sometimes, uh, you know, we think that just women have a, a special cycle in their bodies, but all of us, we have these cycles and rhythms. Our heart also has a rhythm. You know your heart has a rhythm? Sure you do. Try to listen to your, to, to your heart, and, uh, and you can use some devices in order to listen to the rhythm of, of your heart, and your lungs have a rhythm. If you didn't have rhythm in your lungs, you'll be dead. <laughs> so, uh, so without rhythm, we don't even have life. Life depends on rhythm. And when we have uh, sound, when we were here, and we were singing to the Lord, even the mellow songs have a rhythm. We've learned about tempo last week. Today we're going to learn about rhythm. And no, we're not learning music classes. We're, we're learning the Word of God and the importance that we need to give to the Word of God to see these little pearls, these little details uh, that we're going to, to see. Now, in Genesis chapter 2, it says, Thus the, the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his, uh, his work that he had done, and he restored, rested on the seventh day from all his work, all he had done. And I, uh, where's our drummer? Uh, he left? <laughs> oh, he's at the back. Because I've asked our drummer to just to ha give me some help today so we can understand the rhythm of creation. You see, God intended everything with a purpose. 
And it's not by, do you think he could have created everything in one day? Isn't he omnipotent? He could have done everything in one day. Could have done everything in two days. Of course. But God had a rhythm in creation. And the rhythm was six days. And then he rested for one. So I'm going to ask you six bits and, and one that you rest. Six. You're not resting the seventh. You're not resting the seventh. So do the six and do a pause of one. Because that's what we do. You see, also in life, we're asked by the Lord to do six days and rest the seventh. And the seventh belongs to Him. But we do like, just like our drummer did. The six beats, but we need to pause the seventh. Go ahead. Here we go. Thank you so much, David. <laughs> that was great drumming. <laughs> now, w what is rhythm? Rhythm has to do with the beat and the silence in between the beat. So, so when we talk about rhythm and we talk about uh, uh, drums and we talk about, you know, an instrument, Rhythm has to do with the percussion alternating with the moments of silence. When there is nothing, there's, there's something in between. Now, when God established his rhythm in creation, he strictly commanded it's an order for all creation and for us to understand. We work, we do whatever we want for six days, and we take one day for God. Now Christians don't do this. And now I have a silence. Because truly Christians don't take one day for God. They don't rest in that day. This is why, for instance, in a church like ours and most churches in, in our city, some people come to church every Sunday, but some will come every other Sunday. Some will come every two or three Sundays. And if there's something they think it's better to do, they will simply skip church. And as we do these things, we think we're doing our best, you know, to enjoy our life, but we are hindering God from blessing us. Because there's a blessing attached to, the mainta to maintaining this cycle of six, plus one to worship the Lord. Now, I'm not a seven-day Adventist, but I believe in the, in the advent of the seventh day because it's real, it's for true, it's in the Bible. And that movement uh, it was just a, a Christian movement that started as a Christian church that wanted to restore uh, this principle of the Sabbath. Then they degenerate into a, 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 a different kind of religion. It's, it's more like a cult. Now they're trying to come back to Christianity. I'm not talking about Seventh-day Adventists. I'm talking about the Bible, the Word of God. And according to the Bible, the principle is very simple. We work six, we rest one. We work six, or we enjoy six, we rest one. And this is a rhythm. Now, besides this rhythm, there are, there's other rhythms uh, that we can see in Scripture, and that's what I'm going to talk about uh, today. Now, God created our heartbeat, so He created our heart, and when He created us, He established a rhythm. And what's very interesting is none of us has the same heart pattern. We're completely different. You know, if you do one of those cardiograms, have you ever done one? I have to do one every year, <laughs> so in order to monitor my heart, and thank God I have a good heart, but it wasn't always like this. I had a, uh, some, some heart uh, problems, and when we, when we have a heart problem, it has to do with the rhythm of our heart. You know, our heart has an electrical uh, uh, current, and there's electrical impulses in our heart that provoke our heartbeat, and our heartbeat is very complex. It's not a simple thing. It's not just a matter uh, uh, you know, of 90 bits per second or 80 bits or 120. It's m more complex than that. But God gave us our heart. 
and our heart is very important. Now, Scripture mentions the heart in a variety of ways and mentions the heart also as, as uh, our feelings. And, and just recently, I also mentioned this last year, that scientists discovered that our heart, in, in fact, has neurons. The same cells that we have in our brain, there's, there's a, a tens of thousands of these neurons in our heart, and they keep asking themselves, why do we, do we have neurons in the heart? Well, we know why, because the Bible talks about our heart. So we don't not only think here, but we also think here. And scientists thought, no, no, that's just an expression. In fact, they found we have uh, cells that are able to think located in our heart. Isn't that something? Now, our heart keeps beating, and we have this special rhythm in our heart. And there, there are no two uh, uh, physio physiological heartbeats that are, that are exactly the same. So when you compare, and you, you, if you go and you do a cardiogram, you'll see all those graphics and all these things. That, that's not complicated. That's just a, a way of measuring the heartbeat and measures uh, the electrical uh, current the, that you have in your heart. Now, uh, in terms of the Bible, heart is, is uh, associated to passion. And, and for instance, it tells that Solomon had the heart to be a wise ruler. Talks about Moses saying he had a heart for his people. Nehemiah had a heart for Jerusalem. And my question today is, what, what is your passion? What do you have a heart for? I mean in the things of God, do you have a heart for something? You need to have a heart for something. Is it to help others? Is it to pray? Is it, uh, you know, to to spread the, the message of the gospel. We need to have a heart for something. I mean, we're not uh, here in church just to listen to a message. We're here to be, yes, to be inspired. We're here to be motivated. We're here to acquire faith. We're here to give our worship. But we need to come here also with passion. Are we passionate for God? You see, if we're not passionate for God, Christianity and church becomes boring. And then we start seeing all the defects in things. When you're passionate for something, you don't see uh, that is defective. You know, when, I, when I, uh, I become in love with my wife, I mean, she was perfect. And she still is. <laughs> and, and our love is getting better and better. <laughs> Now imagine, I, uh, if, if, uh, if I tell to a person that I love, if I keep telling her all, all her, her defects and problems and, and you don't do this right and you do, don't do that right, and she knows already she's not perfect, but I don't need to remind her. Now in the things of God, when we come to church, church is not perfect. Why should you be reminding the imperfections of the church? Focus in the good things and do things with passion. And when you do things with passion, we have an atmosphere that is called revival. And then we have the perfect environment for God to work. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. We need to have this heart for the things of God. Now, when I, when I was a teenager, uh, I found that in my family, there's a special genetic thing. And most people in my family have what it's called arrhythmia. Uh, some people call it palpitations. I don't know if there's a, a, anyone here with this problem, palpitations. Uh, it's uh, suddenly, it's, uh, you, you don't choose the time when this happens. Suddenly your heart starts to beat in a different way. <laughs> Slows down on, or goes too fast and it's not in rhythm. Doesn't keep the rhythm. It can be, you know, uh, at 120 goes to uh, 80 a minute and goes to 60 and goes to 40. And this can cause chest pain. This can cause you to panic. And some of you are, are doing like this. So I, I can see I was not alone. But you know what? I was healed. Amen. When I came to the Lord, I've never had arrhythmia again. Sometimes my sister calls me. She's a doctor. And she asks me, so uh, have, have you had any episodes of arrhythmia? No, I was healed. Praise God, I was, I, it's one of the, 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 the many healings I received from the Lord. Now, but uh, arrhythmia can cause serious, severe problems. It's, it's, uh, it's like a disease. Now, as Christians, if we have spiritual arrhythmia, 
let me tell you that you can die spiritually also. And what's spiritual arrhythmia? It's when you're not constant in the basic things that Jesus and the Bible and the Old Testament, the whole scripture teaches us to do. And I'm going to mention these things today. So pay attention, take notes, because you're going to learn something that can change your life. Now, prayer is like the heartbeat of our faith. If you don't pray, or if you don't like to pray, or if you don't know how to pray, there's something wrong with your spiritual life. There's an arrhythmia there. There's a problem. There's a blockage. You can have a serious heart problem. And when we have a, a heart problems, something is wrong. Now, the Apostle Paul commanded us to pray continually or without ceasing. This is in 1 Thessalonians 5 and, uh, and uh, on verse 17. It says, pr pray without ceasing. That's a lot of prayer. What does it mean with, without ceasing? Now, we need to investigate further to see the exact meaning of this Bible verse because sometimes it looks like mysterious. Now, when in the Old Testament, uh, the Hebrew word for heart uh, is the word lev. Uh, and uh, lev means inner man, mind, will, heart, understanding. It speaks to the heart, the soul of a man, emotions, passions. It's the same word to describe all these things. That's why when, when we, uh, we talk about the heart, we sometimes we're not talking about the physical heart. We're talking about all these things, the passions, the emotions, but they are connected. You see, there's a reason why our heart is so important. There's a reason when people are in love, they draw a heart. There's a reason why mythology has Cupid with an arrow piercing the heart of, a, uh, uh, of another person. There's a reason for all these things. Our heart is very important. Now, in Genesis 8.21, we see God speaking in his, in his heart, his own heart. So God describes himself as having a heart. So God has a heart. So if God has a heart and we were created in his image, shouldn't we have a heart that is syncopated with the same heartbeat of our God? Or should we try to live our, our life separated from God, ignoring his heartbeat and doing everything we want on our own? So God promised never again to curse the ground or destroy everything living again as he did in the flood. And that's when, when he mentioned, uh, the Bible mentions the heart of God. You know, God has a heart for you. When we say God loves me, God loves you because his heart connects to your heart. Our inner man, our inner person is in our heart. And our heart has this rhythm. And prayer is not only about, about asking, it's about connecting to God. So God created our heart to work 24-7. You know what happens if your, if your heartbeat stops? Anyone knows? I think everyone knows. If your heartbeat stops, that's it. But God created you. You, you don't even think about it. I know through meditation it's possible to slow down our heart. When I was younger and I wasn't a Christian, I did some of those techniques. And I know that through uh, uh, tr uh, transcendental meditation and yoga, all these things, it's possible for you to slow down your heart. Some people are able even to, to paralyze their bodies. They, 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 they slow down their heart with their mind. So, so there's a connection, def definitely. But usually, we're not thinking about our heartbeat unless there's something funny happening. Unless you have a symptom of a heart attack. And it, that's not funny, I'm telling you. I, I, God, God healed me completely. I've been healed from angina for a long time now. I don't take any medication. But uh, when I had uh, some attacks of angina, I had a blockage in, in the arteries. It's not funny at all. It, uh, uh, and, and then I read about it, and it was like this. It's like an elephant in your chest. It's how it's described. And I'm telling you, it's exactly how it feels. Imagine an elephant stepping on your chest. That's the sensation that happens when your heartbeat fails due to a blockage. It's horrible. Some of you are, are frightened with this message because I'm touching something sensitive. I don't want to talk about our physical heart, but I'm reminding you that uh, uh, if our heart beats 
and it beats without ceasing and our life depends on it when Paul is saying pray without ceasing it's exactly what he's saying he's not saying that now you don't work you don't speak you don't do anything you just pray that's not the sense in which he's speaking but he's speaking exactly about the heart so we have burdens that are in our heart and uh, we don't uh, forget about these burdens. I mean, if, you, if you're concerned with something, it keeps bothering you. It keeps bothering you. Now, our spiritual life of prayer must be exactly the same. As our loved ones stay in our heart, and uh, we have concerns that remain, and we have hopes and dreams that remain, we need to learn how to discipline ourselves to pray without ceasing. And this is a choice that you make. You choose to pray. You choose to be in the presence of God. You have this choice. God doesn't force you. And let me tell you, when you learn how to connect with God properly, this is a joy. It's not a burden. It's a great joy. You know, to me, coming to church, is, it's a time of great joy. I don't do any particular sacrifice to come here. And I believe most of you are just like me. You have a great joy of coming to church. But the Bible doesn't tell you that your spiritual life depends on coming to church. It tells you, however, that your spiritual life depends on uh, three little things. And the first one that I want to mention is prayer. You need to be able to connect with God. And your heartbeat should be the same as the heartbeat of God. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 12, it says, Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, and be constant in prayer. Be what? Constant. What does it, does it mean to be constant? You know, if you have a job, do you want to have a constant salary? I know some people are freelancers or artists, or they have other kinds of jobs, and they depend on commission or, or a special prize or something. And sometimes you can do really well. But otherwise, you'll rather have a, 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 a position or a job or something where you know in that day of the month, it's constant. Because guess what? Your mortgage is constant. <laughs> and your payments in, to, to the cell phone company and all these companies, are they constant? Yes, yes they are. You might think, well, I wish they would forget of billing me in the, month, in the month of February or March, it's not going to happen. Why? Because they are constant. My question is, are you constant in prayer? How can we be constant in prayer? Well, we should spend the beginning of our day with God. Prayer, it's, 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 it works two ways. You talk to God, and guess what? He answers. He answers. Some people don't like to talk to God because they think He will not answer. But God answers. So we need to learn how to rejoice, how to be patient. But the very important thing, a very important area of our faith, we need to, le to learn how to be constant in prayer. Now, I, I would like you to turn to the person next to you and tell them, be constant in prayer. Because I don't want to be just myself to tell you. <laughs> Now, let me talk about the rhythm of our hope. The rhythm of our hope. Now, 1 Thessalonians 1.3, again, Paul uh, is teaching these principles, and he's telling the Christians that he's remembering unceasingly your work of faith and labor of love and enduring constancy of hope of our Lord Jesus Christ before our God and Father. Notice it says, constancy of hope of our Lord Jesus Christ. So you can have different kinds of hope. I mean, you can hope to win the 649. That's not this kind of hope. You can hope to get a, a high school diploma. It's not that kind of hope. What, talks, uh, what the Bible is talking is the hope of our Savior. The hope of Jesus Christ. So th this is a different kind of hope. And again, the Bible says that we need to have Enduring constancy. Enduring constancy. Now, I've, I, since I was young, I, I did sports. I did many kinds of sports. 
and uh, and uh, I used to, to to I didn't like to run long distance, but my coach uh, at the time said, "This is what you're good at." I wanted to do the 100 meters, but he said, "No, you cannot break uh, this barrier, so you better go to long distance." And I've learned something. If I if I wanted to to run now 10 kilometers, I couldn't. I wouldn't be able to run 10 kilometers now, guaranteed. I'll run maybe three, and then I'll be so tired that I'll, I'll fall down now or I have to rest. Why? Because I'm not being constant in running. Now, I, I know my body and I know my age, but I still know that if I start running and if I discipline myself running every single day a little bit more, it will take me about a month to run 10 kilometers without being tired. And if I can do it, you can do it. <laughs> I'm telling you, if I discipline myself running, I know how to keep my heartbeat, I know how to keep my lungs disciplined because there's techniques that you learn, and little by little, let's say tops two months, I'll be running 20 kilometers, 30 kilometers, I can run the marathon. I did it and I can do it again. So it's possible to do this. And uh, we have Peter at the back, and he's saying yes. Uh, I don't know if Peter is at the back, but we have a good runner here in, a, in our congregation. Now, enduring constancy. Listen to these words, enduring constancy. And, and we don't like sometimes these, these words, because this requires an effort. And salvation is free. But the things that follow salvation require a price. Jesus Christ paid the price, but you have also a price to pay if you want to receive the good and the best things that God has for you. Now, what is the most precise rhythm device ever made by man? And I was trying to figure this out. And of course, now we have the quartz watches. I remember when I was a kid, they started to sell those watches. And uh, to, uh, if we had a Casio or a Timex, we had, wow, this is a masterpiece of time. Now it's junk watches. Yeah? <laughs> and you can buy a watch at the dollar store. And guess what? They work as well as the Rolex and all these watches. But they're still trying to make unbelievable watches. And uh, a company called Tag Heuer, they, they do this uh, caliber 360. And this is super accurate. It's a mechanical watch, mechanical. It's not electronic, there's no batteries there, and it does 360,000 vibrations in one hour. And they say presently it's the most accurate time machine ever done by man. I know that uh, Omega uh, and, uh, and Seiko must be really upset because they didn't do this watch. And maybe they say, oh no, our watch is better. Our Rolex is better, this one is better. But people have a fascination with these devices we call watches, and they're used just to measure rhythm. And you say time. Yes, they measure time. But the way they measure time, it's by keeping a constant rhythm. And the more constant the rhythm is, the, most, the more accurate that watch is. So we have these machines, and we're even here at the church, and we have so many watches. You need a watch in your cell phone. We have watches in everything. Computers have watches. We have watches, you know, literally every single device, uh, electronic device, has to have a watch because it's important that those devices function with a precise rhythm. Rhythm is so important. Do we have rhythm in our spiritual life? Do you have constancy in your prayer life? Do you have constancy in your hope? Do you have constancy in battling for the things that really matter? When we pick up a fight, we should be able to pick up the ones that matter. Otherwise, we'll be wasting our time. How is the rhythm of your spiritual heart? Does your heartbeat lean towards God? Do you have constancy? Do you read the Bible? Or try to read the Bible at least once every day? And this is my second little 
nugget, the precious things that you need to learn about this constancy. Number one, prayer. Number two, reading the Bible. Do you spend time reading the Bible? You know, I have tons of books right here on my, on my tablet. I love these tablets because I can buy the book and I can be read, reading the book in, in about a minute and I pay half the price that, that I'll pay if I go to the, to the bookstore. And so I love the, these, to read the books there. And I have a ton of books over here. In fact, I have thousands of books. You know, I have all my pastor's encyclopedia. I have literally thousands of Christian books that I can have available right here in my hand. Isn't this amazing? This is the world where we live in. And we have all these resources. But let me tell you, I will not spend time reading Christian books only because I need my time with the Lord. If I wake up in the morning like it happened today, I have a discipline. Every time I wake up in the morning or during the night, my discipline is to immediately go somewhere and read the Bible. Why do I have this discipline? Because I know that everything happens for a purpose. And if I'm awake, I might as well have this discipline. If I wake up during the night, I read the Bible. Maybe you wake up during the night and you go and read your phone bill. That's not good. You're not going to have peace. You're not going to, to fall asleep again. You're going to worry even more. But you can have this discipline of worrying. You know, the Bible says, do not conform with this world, but be transformed. How? Through the Word of God. In your mind, in your inner person, in your heart. Do you try to listen to God at least one day in your busy week? One day. That's today. Now, I'm almost finishing in 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Paul said, therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast. Complicated word. word immovable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Now, steadfast immovable. Thank God for the English Bible. This sounds really good. Now, if you go to other languages, if you go to a French or a Spanish Bible, this Bible verse is a little bit different. It says to be constant and steadfast. What stead steadfast means is to be firm. But we're missing here in our English Bibles that element of constancy that, that, is, that is here in the right meaning of this Bible verse. And I don't want to add anything to Scripture. I just want to explain Scripture. And what Paul is saying, be steadfast, be firm, be constant, knowing this, that your labor, whatever you do for God, is not in vain. Now, I did a lot of things in vain. I don't know if you did that, uh, certain things in vain. I mean, you do something and you do it for nothing. Or uh, you're at the work and the, the boss tells you to do something and you do it the best you can and, and then he comes and says, this is all wrong, do it again. Say, oh my God, <laughs> oh Jesus, help me. <laughs> I, I work in vain. Or even worse, you work and you don't get paid. You've worked in vain. You may, might have produced something, but you worked in vain. Now we have this promise that in the Lord, our labor, our work is not in vain. So we need to have this constancy. And finally, this is my, my final point. How's the rhythm of your brain? How's your brain going? <laughs> you might think, well, I have some brain problems. I have uh, diff difficulty in memorizing things. I have problems at school. And some people can have brain problems. You know our brain has uh, electrical uh, impulses called brain waves. So scientists uh, figured out that we have a rhythm in our brain. And if we have the right rhythm in our brain cells, this is, this is the part of our body that is used to learn, learn things. So for instance, you're here and you're listening to a message. And, and you can be in this uh, uh, with a open heart and say, God speak to me. God speak to me. And, and you're listening. And your brain is functioning, I hope. <laughs> uh, 
And, and as you're listening to things, you're able to retain things. Now, some people, their brain waves are distorted and they cannot learn anything. So we, we can develop a process, it's very complex, these operations, but in order to, to, uh, to learn things, you need to have rhythm in your brain. Do you know that you can train your brain? How do you think someone becomes a, a RCMP agent? Or FBI or CIA or whatever. Those people that look to something and they can see the little details that no one can see. I was watching a TV series called Monk. It's very interesting. It's this, this man, he's uh, different from everybody, but he can see things where nobody can, nobody can because he's, he, his eyes trained and he has this kind of uh, uh, autistic thing in him and he's able to see things. You see, all of us are different. We're all different and we have different brain waves. I don't know if you agree with me, but I know this is the truth. This is why sometimes you have sympathy for certain people and sometimes you don't get along with others It's because I guess you have a different brain wave. You think differently and we think differently. You know, I, I really uh, admire uh, some, some people and some nations. I really ad admire, you know, the Japanese and the, the Korean, you know, the, the way that their brain works. It's unbelievable. Unbelievable. And they, they build societies that, that are so uh, efficient and it's so smart. They're so civilized. I'm not saying they're better, but I admire. But I admire also when I can go to a, a place, you know, down in South America or, or Africa where people just relax and time has no meaning. <laughs> I, I also appreciate that. When they say, let's go to church. And, and, uh, and every time I go there, I, now I don't care. I don't even carry a watch anymore. First, it can be stolen. <laughs> and second, I don't need it. I don't need it because, you know, uh, church is when people arrive. Oh, and when is that? Oh, they can arrive at 9 or at 10. Depends. If it's raining, we might start at 12. <laughs> so civilizations and people and different people have different brain waves. I like to be on time. And I'm re really upset with myself if I'm five minutes late. Maybe you don't care to you, you know, being on time or half an hour late, let them wait. We're all different. You see, we have different brain waves. And God knows you. And sometimes we're damaged. And we need to be fixed. And no one can fix my brain but God. Amen. No one can fix my heart but God. I know I can take medication. I know I can do a, a, a series of different things, but I need to rely on God. And best of all, when I have a discipline and a constancy, I don't, need ha I don't even have to ask him to fix me. He does it automatically. <laughs> he does it automatically. You know, he can cure Alzheimer's disease. You know, he can, can cure high blood pressure. He can cure diabetes, liver disease, doesn't matter what. And how does he do it? Supernaturally. He does a, an intervention in the rhythm of your body, in the rhythm of your soul. And we need to understand these interventions. interventions. Now, habits, a habit is defined as a recurrent and unconscious pattern of, be of behavior that is acquired through frequent repetition. A habit is a learned rhythm in life. Do you have good spiritual habits? And I've mentioned one, prayer. I mentioned a second, reading the Bible. And I'm mentioning a third, coming to church or the assembling of the brethren, as the Bible calls it. Those are habits, and we learn them. You know, if you learn to brush your teeth, you, if you get that, that habit, you won't go a week without brushing but some people do, I'm telling you, my nose is very accurate. <laughs> some people don't care because they don't have a habit. So we need to develop habits. 
And I've mentioned this scripture, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. So we can replace the bad habits by good ones. If you don't have the habit of prayer, if you don't have the habit of reading the Bible, if you don't have the habit of coming to church, those are spiritual habits or disciplines that will help you to have the same heartbeat of God. The three most important habits, prayer, Psalm 55, 17, evening and morning and noon, I will pray, I'll, call, I'll cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. This talks about three times, right? A day. Three times a day. Morning, evening, right? Okay. Now, do you know Muslims pray how many times a day? You know that. And Christians pray how many times a day? I'll better not go there. <laughs> I'll better not go there. Because this is really, really sad. It's really sad. That sometimes Christians fight for their faith. But they're not even able to do. What some people that have a God. I'm, I'm saying it. A God that is not always a loving God. <clears throat> and they pray for that God five times a day. Now this is so silent. I hope you're feeling condemned because it's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> a little condemnation is good for us sometimes. Reading the Bible. Notice what Paul was saying about the Bereans. He was saying, now the Bereans were more noble of character than the Thessalonians. Well, this is kind of, you know, it's like saying, now people from Montreal have a better character than people from Toronto. Yeah. And you say, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I guess the Thessalonians don't like this scripture. Nevertheless, let, let us see why. It says, for they received the message with great eagerness and examine the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. Okay? So, they were more noble. Why? Because they examined Scripture to see if, he, if he, what he was saying was the truth. I really appreciate if you can examine, you know, the messages that are being preached here and examine if they are the truth. It's very important. It's very important when you come to church that you examine the Scripture. Don't just buy it because a preacher is preaching here. Examine it yourself. I think this is a good preaching. <laughs> you know, Christians should think. Now, if you don't study the Bible, how should you know if it's truth? Now, don't do it like some people do. They write, you know, chain letters, you know, criticizing everything and everybody. But they don't know what, I talk, what they're talking about. Now, this is one of the reasons why we have our Bible school. So we can learn scripture, so we can debate scripture, and let's see if what's being preached is the truth. Now when Paul said the Bereans, the Bereans were doing something better than the Thessalonians, he's not criticizing the Thessalonians. He's just saying something good about the Bereans. I hope you understand this. He's not focusing on the negative, but he's really encouraging them to do the positive. I hope you understand this. And by examining the scriptures, I mean, you should read the Bible yourself. And finally, the assembling together. Hebrews 10, 25, and let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another. Encourage who? One another. So who should encourage people to come to church? All of us. All of us. But it's not the role of the pastor to be chasing everyone around that doesn't come to church. No. That's your role. That's your job. If you see there's someone that usually comes to church, they're not coming, encourage them. Well, this is not me speaking. It's the scripture. And I hope you're feeling condemned right now. <laughs> because you might say, Oh no, we, we, we pay the pastor to do this. No, no. You get it all wrong. Get it all wrong. We cannot neglect assembling ourselves. 
and if we see someone is neglecting and we don't do anything about it, this will be required from you. Because one day you'll be accountable to God and guess what? God is going to ask you. What did you do about jo Joanne? She used to come to church, sit beside you. She stopped coming, you didn't care. You'll be required, I'm telling you. I hope you're feeling condemned. Because I want to help you this morning. I don't want you to leave this place in condemnation, no. But sometimes we need to learn this rhythm, this discipline. The worst thing for a musician to do is to play with a drummer that doesn't keep the beat. It is terrible. Or a church when somebody is leading worship and you have a tambourine playing a different song. It's terrible. But when everything is in harmony, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. See, how, how can we be victorious in our life? We need to be disciples. And in order to be disciples, we need to follow the discipline of someone. And this is why God gives to the church, the pastors, the apostles, the evangelists, the prophets, and the teachers. It's so that you can be discipled by them. And there's a season for everything. You now, when I went to school, I spent 10 years in university. I had many teachers. I liked some better than I liked the others. But I made sure that I never failed one of my courses. Even if I didn't like the teacher, I didn't want to fail the course. Even if you don't like the pastor, don't fail your spiritual life. I'm telling you this in love. Because if you don't allow God to fix your heart, and if you don't learn the rhythm of your spiritual life, something bad is about to happen. Now I'm getting so tired, I, I think I need something. Oh, that's going to feel good. I'm going to cover because I don't want to do publicity. But so, some of you know what I'm drinking. Ah, it feels good, it's fresh. It's, a, it's an energy drink. Have you ever tried an energy drink? Do you know how, why people drink energy drinks? You don't know? <laughs> well, they started with Gatorade saying, you know, drink this and you'll be so energetic. It doesn't really work. I'm telling you what works in those energy drinks, it's an ingredient that I can get at Starbucks and at Tim Hortons. Caffeine. That's what gives you the boost. And I really enjoy coffee. You enjoy coffee? You're free to drink coffee. God created coffee. <laughs> I know Pastor Jordan was telling something that I, I, I was teaching him, that one of the reasons we know that Mormons are not from God, it's because they forbid people to drink coffee. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <clears throat> Some religions, they forbid all these things. But energy drinks were created so people could have a, a little boost of energy. And it's okay to drink once in a while. I don't drink them very often. But guess what? People from 13 to 35 are 90% of the consumers of energy drinks. So if you're above 35, like me, most likely you don't drink a lot. If you're in your 80s, please don't drink an energy drink <laughs> because your heart might uh, be affected. And people want this boost because of a lack of discipline or energy. Now, when the Bible says in Psalm 119, 164, seven times a day I praise you, how many times? Seven. Okay, so now, how many times do we pray? Three. And how many times we praise? Seven. Wow, that's a lot of times. And how many, uh, this is a week? No, it's a day. Seven times a day I will praise you. Wow, seven times a day. Do you praise the Lord seven times a day? I'm telling you, today you need an energy drink in the spirit. <laughs> you need to leave this place energized to change your patterns of life. Energized to say, I'm going to make a change. 
And I decide today that I'm not going to faint because some people are heart-fainted people. Why? Because their hearts are not ready. Scripture says that in the end time, many will turn their back on faith. Why? Because they're looking at the world instead of having spiritual disciplines. My heartbeat, my song, is the song of the Lord. You know, Jesus Christ is waiting for you to make a decision. Seven times a day, I praise you. And I like to end by drinking my energy drink. And some of you are so jealous. <laughs> some of you are thinking, well, not that one is sugar free. I don't like the sugar free. Do you need a boost? Were you ever in a situation when the battery of your car died and you need cables? And you desperately go around trying to find someone with cables to give you a boost? I usually carry cables, but someone took my cables. I need to buy new ones. But I always carry cables because I like to give boosts to, to people. And, uh, and this is because I'm a pastor. And I'm here to give you a boost, a boost of energy. Today, you need to drink from the fountain. You need to come to the Lord. And if you realize that your rhythm is not perfect, that it's boring to come to church, that it, you're bored when you, you call for a prayer meeting, when it's a night of worship, you don't even care to come to church. Why come? Worship? Listen, you should praise and worship seven times a day. So if, if, uh, if the pastor tells you come here for a night of worship once a month, I guess once a month it's a little bit less than seven times a day. This is so silent. So I hope you really got you know, the cap in your head because this message was all for you. All for you that are not praying. All for you that are not reading the Bible. All for you that are neglecting coming to church in a regular way. But I don't want you to leave this place offended. And I want, don't want to leave this place thinking, well, I should be better and not doing anything about it. But I'd like to give you the opportunity right now to get things straight, to fix your life, to come to the Lord and tell, Lord, I, I truly want to follow the rhythm of your heart. I want my heartbeat to be the same as your heartbeat. When you hug someone, there's a reason why when we hug, our hearts get together. There's a reason why John said, I am the one who laid my head on his chest because he was listening to the heartbeat of Jesus. There's a reason why the heart is so important. And if we neglect these things, if we don't have constancy, if we're not re willing to endure things, we will not be even saved. Because scripture says, he that endures to the end shall be saved. Salvation is automatic. When you come to the Lord, you give your life to the Lord, you're saved. But you're not saved forever. That's bad doctrine. People think because they lift up their hand or they come to church, they're saved. This is really bad. It's a lie. Because the reality is this. If you want to keep saved, you need to have the heartbeat of God. Your life will become easier. You'll, you'll walk in victory. You depend on the Lord. Now you have this habit. You have this discipline. You know, and the habit it starts every day you're praying. You praise the Lord. You know, buy some tapes and CDs. Put it in the car and praise the Lord seven times a day. That's not much. That's not much. Wow, this is so silent in this Presbyterian church. <laughs> I think you need a boost. I think we all need some energy drink. And you know how I know this? When I come to church, I have a thermometer. 
It's called an, an amen -mometer. <laughs> It's uh, When I'm preaching, if there's no amens, it's telling me something. <laughs> if, this, if there is too many amens or amens out of place, it tells me something also. When you say, the devil is here, somebody says, amen. <laughs> something, something is dead wrong there. When I come to worship, if people have their hands in their pockets and they're trying just to appreciate the technique of the musicians, that tells me something too. But when we're at the church and we praise the Lord and we touch heaven, that shows me that there's a discipline. There's something happened. The heartbeat of God is there. Some of you told me, oh, when I was younger, we, we used to speak in tongues and had prophecies during the service. Hey, Amen. Let's have it again. Amen. Let's start with you that said so. <laughs> Let's start with you that, that are saying th those things. You should be the one praying and speaking in tongue, tongues and prophesying so others will follow you. Right. Amen. <laughs> Because this thing of being Christian, it's infectious in the good sense. It's viral. When, when you start walking with God, it's viral in the good sense. It's in the sense we catch it. And we catch that fire. And we have that fire in us. And I'm telling you, when you catch that fire, I don't care. I can be in, in a place where nobody worships the Lord, but I will. I can be in a place where people are offended when the Word of God is preached, but I continue to preach it. And I can be in a place full of religious spirits, but I'm not following the religion. I follow the Lord of hosts. So let us all stand together now. And I'm going to ask you to come here and not to get my energy drink. I'm going to hide it here. But if you realize that you need something in your life, you're not being disciplined. This place is called the altar, and I, uh, the musicians, uh, please join if you c could come to the stage. We're going to finish in praise and worship. But I would like to give you the opportunity before you leave this place. Don't leave this place offended by the message or condemned by the message, but leave this place determined. Determined. Now, like that person that realized that going to a scale and having 350 pounds that goes beyond the scale, it's being overweight. And that person realizes, I need to do something about it. But they can also say, no, it's too late. Let, let me just lay in my bed and eat, eat the hamburgers from McDonald's or whatever. Requires discipline to lose weight. Requires discipline to make money. Requires discipline to be good at something requires discipline to be saved. And here I know you might say, oh, I don't agree with you. Well, so we, I guess you're not going to heaven. You're not going to heaven. You will only go to heaven when you keep the flame. When you, you're a virgin that has light. There's oil in that lamp. And in order to do so, go get the oil. Go get the oil. Shine with your light. And start it today. Start today by telling, Lord, yes, I used to pray. I used to come to prayer meetings. I used to have prayer meetings in my house. I used to do all these things. And now I'm not doing any of these things. Why don't you tell the Lord, Lord, I'm willing to be changed and transformed by the renewing of, our, of my mind. Because you see, sometimes people develop brain waves <coughs> that are the brain waves of the world instead of having the brain waves of God. God sees this world through a different set of glasses, different eyes than you do and I do. That's why he says, don't judge. Let me judge things. But he also says, come to me, all of you that are oppressed, that are tired, that are, that are we weary, come to me and 
I'll set you free. I want to give you some extra energy. I want to change your spiritual life. I want to, to see your life being transformed in your heart from a heart of stone to a heart of flesh. See, the heart of stone doesn't beat. The heart of stone is dead. And many people are in the church, but their hearts are dead. In order to have your heart revived, God is here this morning to touch you. And the choice is yours. Don't hide from God, because you came here and He requires just something. The humility to say, yes, God, I need to discipline my life. I need to pray more. I want to start my day with prayer. I want to pray three times a day. I want to pray seven times a day. I want to be changed. Help me, God. I don't want to come to church and be bored. I want to do something. Constancy and endurance. As the praise and worship team leads us in worship, just come forward. Some of you asked me for prayer, prayers for healing. Come also here to the altar. We pray also for healing. We pray for whatever you need to pray. But the most important thing, if you need to tell the Lord, Lord, my heartbeat, my heartbeat is far from you. Restore me. Now this is the time to tell to the Lord. If you, if you don't know how to read the Bible, you're feeling bored as you read the Bible, I want to pray for you. Because something spiritual is about to happen today, this morning. You're going to leave this place with the boost of energy, with the boost of the Holy Spirit. So please come forward and I'm going to ask intercessors, pastors, deacons, you know, come forward and, and help us to pray as we build an altar to the Lord.